that let me <laughs> that's very important um so yes uh what does i say all right thank you everyone for coming my name is kiran butt and i am the curator for the gold chakkar which is an international indian origin series about how different indian authors around the world are facing with the era of globalization and one of the things that has globalized us the most interestingly enough is the covid pandemic which has also shut us down the most <laughs> an interesting paradox between being stuck at home and also doing events all around the world so we I have not really covered um the pandemic but um I being abroad felt so much um looking at the news looking at the media and seeing all these horrible things in knowing that people who I know personally were also dealing with a very bad situation so I wanted to create a space where maybe we could talk about it maybe we could write po- like we could use poetry as well as a space to kind of protest and give consideration to the way that um this pandemic has shaped us and um what it's kind of made different for us um the organizer of the chakkar is karan madok who's also with us he also might be reading some poetry which i'm really excited to hear and um i'll also let him speak for a second so he can introduce his own magazine his own space kiran uh first of all thank you anju akriti ashwini swanet thank you guys so much for joining us today and for giving us your time like this is um I, i as we've already discussed before we started recording this is something that i think we all felt was necessary just to get together and converse about everything about life and and i feel that the poetry you guys write and the poetry that i'm sure that you guys are are going to speak today will will really help our listeners and will really help honestly will help each other actually to to get through sometimes you know and there there is a power to words there is a power to poetry so thank you guys so much for joining us um as kiran mentioned i am the editor and co-founder of chakkar.com we are, are we are an indian arts review we publish a bunch of like indian reviews on you know uh, various indian arts film literature etc we also publish poetry fiction stuff like that so uh, and and this this program this uh, the gold chakkar event uh, this has been kiran's brainchild we've been doing this now i think about 7 or 8 months now it's been it, it's been one of the silver linings of uh our sort of disconnected era our socially distanced era that we've been able to come together on zoom and do this so uh thank you guys again for joining us and yeah the, the stage is over to you I, i would love to hear from you from you guys and uh kiran why don't you go and go ahead and get get it started uh want to introduce the readers today yeah, 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 yeah. and also i'll also express gratitude because i've also loved doing the gold chakkar and i think it's been wonderful to have a spotlight on a lot of indian artists so i think have not been getting enough global attention and trying to create a space for them to be at least heard or possibly read more so i also want to send my appreciation for you for giving me the chance to even do this but uh, <laughs> thank you so much so i think i'll go in alphabetical order i'll i'll ask each of you to just take a second i mean right now just keep it a little bit of an introduction of yourself uh, maybe a little bit of what pandemic life is meant for you and then a poem so akriti can you please start for us and tell us of course where you're from and a little bit about your background okay um hi everyone i'm akriti and um so um as you know i do write poems and uh, i think uh, personally i did uh, sign up for this event because part of the reason i write uh, poetry came from um, sort of a sense of suffering and uh, that is something i communicated with kiran as to what you know i'd like to talk about or address uh, you know grief when it's at a molecular level mm. and uh, so um, you know when we read about all these news about the pandemic and there are so many questions that we need to discuss on a pragmatic scale you know what is happening how we could have avoided the second wave and uh, then there is the you know um news that we get from our friends from our peers and that's not something that uh, the media can ever cover because how we are feeling or how we are coping in reality at a molecular level that is something i think we could discuss today and uh, part of the, i hope could be part of our conversation so um i think i'll uh, read some something that i've written and i'll start with the poem so in this way i feel like the pandemic is sort of stripped parts of the reality that we were submerged in and life as you'd say you know we once knew it and uh, for most of us it's reshaped it so for some of us it may not be a very dramatic change and from what i see i think uh, most of us are still grappling with the re- 
very existence is the bare thought that this has happened. Because when I read the news, we uh, don't know the future projections as well. We don't know how long it's going to be. And um, endemics, pandemics, they can take years to go as well. But the truth is that we are still like uh, just in this disturbance. And we don't know, and probably we don't want to think that far. There's this reluctance because we are barely able to cope with, you know, what is here with us. And that's what probably we need to do at this moment, especially with the second wave hitting us so hard, you know, coping with what is here. And um, so the first poem that I have, uh, uh, that I'll be reading, is, uh, you know, primarily targeted as grief. So because what I think uh, what happens to is, um, when people especially people who would go who are going through losses you know like real losses as in you know deaths or seeing suffering in a manner that they have never witnessed before like going to hospitals and then covid is a different kind of experience i think because i remember reading another poet's post and uh, unlike a normal hospital you know hospitalization experience where you may have the care of your loved ones always you know, COVID is like you're in isolation. So it's, um, it's very unsettling because uh, you don't have anybody. And then there is the shock, you know, that shock and denial that exists both at, um, you know, with the body, the inertia of your being, you know, sort of coming to a full stop. And then also at an existential level, because I see a lot of people, you know, talking about when they see these, um, when they see you know, when you see the news and it floods you and you also know that this is happening. And I think so, you know, it's affecting everybody and in a different way. So this first poem that I have is, uh, I've titled it Red Dawn. And uh, this is actually a personal, extra I wrote this uh, during the second wave, but it's a personal experience. And it's about a sort of how you wake up, you know, from a surgery. And I also think it's kind of how you react to when you, uh, you know, encounter acute grief or suffering for the first time to any kind of loss. And uh, so I'll start with this poem. Um, it's titled Red Dawn. That first moment, a white lightning rod threading the spine, bronchi and bones. There it is, the body in the hemispheres of nausea half teacups of life dripping from its mouth. A rush, life enters, a comet, full, replete, utterly void in its largeness. It enters and shakes the body's dreaming flatness, the cheeks now spilling tomatoes, a fever slimming down the mole that centers the neck, holds its innate tension in place. The pineal gland above the butterfly skeleton ear where the sharper nodes of light transform into a shade of suffering. There, then, aghast, lies the body, never more naked to life. Its bones curl, it roams in the velvet curves of blood. Fingers, like a dance of cutlery, swim to the wound site. What is this holiness of punctures? A doctor's voice bubbles in the air. The mind is parts, not yet whole. The semblance to being only shock. Shock is the entire concave socket where the entire body is floating, a mad light fluttering in nauseating pen strokes, or ensues the bright light of the operation room, an eclipse, and the violating aroma of 10,000 chemicals. The body wakes from its deepest sleep, anesthesia crunching matter and mind alike for the first time. As such, one has no memory of sleep simply wakes as if collapsing into another cylindrical darkness. Then, like a switch, the body resets itself. A single thought, the remembrance of where one is, the knowledge of the skin being cut, organs squirming. But the body does not acknowledge. It sleeps so empty. Life is now bits, paper parts, a scattered collage. The body swims through the entire state of being, now awake, and does only that which makes no sense vomits all over space and time. Thank you. So, um, I think, yeah, I, I know it's a rather intense poem <laughs> to start with. Very nice, very nice. Okay. I really love yeah. it, of the words bubbling. That's such an interesting way of thinking. And then that ending was also, it really feels you in the moment. I, I sort of wanted to project, you know, what it is like at a molecular level when we experience grief because uh, that is what is happening for so many people, especially people who I know, even young people, who you know, 
who are um, going through this experience, it's really a shock for them and the anxiety, the paranoia, the uncertainty of it. And it's not something that you immediately recover from either. And uh, it will take, it's a journey, I think. The whole healing will be a journey and how we'll cope with it in the future. And uh, sort of want to project, uh, you know, the base reality, the visceral reality of somebody who goes through it. And uh, but there is another poem, so I could either read it later or... Uh, Oh yeah, why well, don't, yeah, let me, yeah, I was thinking of a time limit, but I'm thinking this poem is really interesting and I, but I'm wondering, yeah, maybe we can have like a, more of a chorus of all the poets actually at the end, maybe then that might be better even, so we can plan it differently. Yeah. So sure, and even I was saying alphabetical order, but now that I uh, have read your, or I've heard your poem, I think Ashwani's poetry makes sense to come after yours <laughs> because of what I know he's going through as well. So I'll ask Ashwani now to, Ashwani sir, to please step up and uh, tell us a little bit about his work and what he's going through and then read from his work. He's unmuted. Yeah, please unmute yourself if you can. I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I'm really typically very absent-minded, uh, always been absent-minded. Uh, Anju knows this, Anif knows this. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed uh, uh you know, uh, poem. And uh, I was thinking how to respond, you know, uh, uh, a lot of things I've done you know, uh, in the last uh, 10 to 12 months. Uh, I, I don't know, Kiran, when we were talking uh, to each other about uh, the impact, you know, the lasting impact. Uh, you know, Anju is here, I was senior, uh, you know, leading poet, translator, uh, and a thinker. So I'm thinking about, you know, uh, in a Gadamerian sense of, you know, what is going to be my, uh, my, you know, way of looking at, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, you know, in a more philosophical sense, you know, how do I deal with, uh, you know, this crisis, you know, uh, it's a lifetime crisis, you know, uh, fortunately, I'm alive, so I could witness this, what's happening. There are many gone, you know, my best friends have gone, my boo are gone, uh, you know, a lot of people have gone. So they can't, they can't even imagine, you know, what has happened uh, uh, to all of us, you know, because death will never come back and talk about it. Uh, but, but in a, in a very, but, but, but in a, in a sense, uh, uh, you know, again, back to uh, what Heidegger famously said, dwelling you know i can't leave my dwelling you know this is the dwelling not in a spatial sense you know so these days uh, you know some of the writings uh, and especially in my poems i'm reflecting on love ritual of life sensual world you know rather than screaming you know i, I have published a very long poem uh, new and old memories you know it's a, a kid and i've shared with people. i haven't shared with many people and it's a very long and it's kind of about a genesis of the politics of hatred uh, and the virus, you know. So what I'm going to do, summarize in few words, that I'm looking at the idea of sensual love. And I'm also looking at the idea of what uh, in Indian ethics and Indian philosophical sense is called karuna. You know. It's more powerful than grieving. I want to dwell in karuna as a poet, as a writer, as a thinking not perhaps homo sapiens, you know, because now homo sapiens have done to themselves, uh, we deserve it, uh, what has happened to us. So with these few words as an introductory note to my poem, it's, it's a very short poem. Of late, I'm writing very short poems, and uh, I'm happy that uh, Sampurna has encouraged me to also experiment with the uh, uh, new linguistics uh, of short poems. So I'm gonna read this poem, my poem is, love in Plato's cave, you know. I will not explain it because, you know, in terms of linguistics, it has multiple meanings, you know, philosophical, poetic, and allegorical meanings. The title of the poem is Love in Plato's Cave. Imagine this, imagine this, shackled by the legs and nets, lovers are kept under the earth in a cave-like dwelling. Imagine this, shackled by the legs and Next, lovers are kept under the earth in cave-like dwelling. There is no fire here, only shadows of grasshoppers on the wall, listening the sounds of listening, leaking, loud tongues of lovemaking. When we reach the orgasmic end of the captivity, I push the floral skin of suffering aside 
I smell the pink darkness, light and soft. A flash of insanity overcomes. A flash of insanity overcomes us. We deep throat all our imperfections. I don't know. I don't know if this is alchemy, if this is alchemy or pseudo science of infection. But when we come out of the cave, our eyes are filled with darkness. Perhaps we endure depravity more ruthless in the sunlight. Thank you very much. Very nice. Very nice. A good thought. By nice direct lines as well. And it's my revenge against my teacher Plato, you know, who has bothered me for the last 30 years. <laughs> I mean, I'm very, I'm very thankful to you know pandemic that has allowed me to come back and you know deal with the haunting plateau in my life. Thank you. And that's that is good. It's good that this is hopefully something that all this personal grief you're going through will eventually come to another conclusion, which you can channel to your through whatever you put onto the paper. So, um, Anju, ma'am, would you like to uh, speak up and maybe read from your work and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, I mean, I'm a poet and playwright. I think that's enough. And a translator. And uh, I think uh, Ashwini knows me well. And I think even the others probably. So basically a poet, playwright and translator. And that should be enough. Uh, you know, when you, uh, when I saw your title, Poetry and the Pandemic, it was so broad. So I thought, well, you did mention the second wave. So that narrows it down, but from the readings, we can tell that it's still very broad. And there is so much we could cover in this topic. And uh, as poets are and will be, they will have this thinking that is always, always goes to the skies and encompasses everything. Like, so I thought maybe I should narrow in a bit this morning, I was thinking, and the main thing about poetry, I think, I want to say one or two obvious things first. The obvious thing was, uh, I realized, and as all of us do, it has been our savior in a way. Ashwini might agree or not. It has in a way allowed us to function in these very difficult times. So that is the obvious thing. And uh, also, I think it has encouraged a lot of sharing. Maybe it's only on FB, which is very uh, frustrating, but it encourages people to share and come closer. I think as a poetry community, we have come closer. So we feel the distance naturally, it's only on FB. And the other point which I just uh, wanted to mention here was, uh, see, as uh, Akriti mentioned that we are under this lockdown and all of us are feeling trapped. But our imagination is not under lockdown, is it? So as long as we have that freedom, we should not worry too much, I think. Because that's what perhaps makes the human different from the other creatures. They need to roam more. We also need to roam, especially if, if you're young. But I think our imagination is roaming. Kiran is, of course, roaming all over, <laughs> physically. <laughs> He's having a good time. But uh, I thought, you know, my imagination is not under lockdown. So why should I worry so much about it? So that, that's another thought I had. And uh, I thought I would focus on uh, children. Now, Ashwini is quite familiar with my some of my work for youngsters. Everybody's writing about their pain and their feelings, which is good. We need to do that. But what about those poor kids out there? Who's looking after their them? And, you know, we don't want to get in this Modi bashing mood because he's been bashed enough. There's nothing left to bash in them, I think. <laughs> but I got a strange uh, kind of video this morning from a friend from Bangalore. And she, it was about children in a slum, like a sort of a workshop, making COVID swaps. They were packing the swaps. And the environment was so dirty you can't imagine. It was like those filthiest place you've seen. And uh, those swabs were, of course, meant for our use. That aside, the conditions they were working in were absolutely horrible. So I thought I would 
write a poem uh, about that till I realized I already had a poem which is part of my series called Minor Voices where I have been taking the voice of the child and Ashwini has seen this in my book and I want to give them some kind of a voice so I take the voice I guess and instead of writing about the swaps this time I'll just read a poem which is already published and uh, in this book and it says Zari Saris. Now these kids in Bombay, they are working in little, little units, dirty factories, I won't call them factories, dirty holes where they manufacture saris for Bollywood and they are using these, uh, you know, that uh, the embroidery, they do the embroidery on these, you know, the gold wires they put. So it's really awful what they have, they've been through. And forget the part that, they, that their parents are dying, they've become migrants, they went back, they came back in the second wave here. They are again with us. And I've been talking to some NGOs that I'm connected with. And they told me it's again awful because they are back again after going home. And again, they have to work not in the same factory, but in a swap factory perhaps. So this poem is called Zari Saris. It really highlights their situation. You have to imagine a small girl about 14 is talking or 13 or 12. My body is covered with sweat and shine, shine and sweat. I live in Dharavi, wake up at 6 a.m. My fingers move quickly, stitching gold wires on glittering saris ordered by Bollywood. My body is covered with sweat and shine, shine and sweat. I bathe once a week. Fleas settle in between my itchy fingers. I chew zarda daily. I live in a jaw like a frightened deer. My body is covered with sweat and shine, shine and sweat. I'm not complaining, though I should. I'm the smartest in the group. My boss is a crook. He traps tribal children, brings them to the city. Someone, stop him, please. So, Very uh, powerful poem. And I, I really appreciate you doing this. One, I appreciate you injecting a little bit more of optimism into our group and also trying to especially given how <laughs> kind of the you know very um the, how the other two poems were although your poem was also very i think towards that side as well but i like that it was uh, from a more kind of socialist literature perspective of trying to give voice to a person or a space that might not be heard otherwise so i i, I really liked the poem and i like the repetitions as well Kiran, I want to come in here yes. because see, uh, 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 the fact that you look at uh, agency, uh, we are adults, you know, so homo sapiens speak, but they don't give agency to children. So that's where Anju's work uh, is so important for all of us. We are lost in our adult world, we speak to each other, and there is no sense that, you know, they are as much humanity as ours. So that's very important. In pandemic, yes. perhaps, you know, but children, the voices of children or young adults, they don't hear. Yes, and then that added element of also the labor class, which then also is such an ignored class in India, almost disposable bodies, which is... Un is and that, that, that is where, Kiran, we were talking about last time, you know, also that, you know, where, you know, can subalterns ever speak, you know? Can yeah. poetry even relate to subalterns? I mean, it's very important for poets and writers to understand that very speakability, and the speech of the subaltern. What are we doing? So will this pandemic impact us so deeply that it will lead to new understanding, normative, philosophical understanding of relating to the speech, you know, speech of subaltern. That's very interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting question as well. I think I will, I'd almost want to ask it maybe after Sonnet reads his poem, because I think I, w I do want to give him space. And he's been very silent. He's been the most silent yeah. of the four of us, actually. Surprisingly yeah. so. So I, <laughs> I want to... <laughs> and he's, going to he, he's going to kill me with his silence, I'm sure. So well, um, uh, uh, thanks, Kiran. I was just enjoying listening to everyone, because these days you 
uh, don't get to talk with a lot of people, especially when you like you miss the old days of getting together in poetry festivals or events. Uh, but uh, regarding the degree of harshness inflicted uh, by this second wave, uh, like on the daily lives of people, uh, this uh, doesn't need to be mentioned uh, like separately here. It's all over. And in Bengal, uh, like we were kind of seeing it coming with these election rallies and everything that were going on like since January or maybe before that. For me, like uh, as a person, I love traveling. I travel a lot. And as a person who believes in traveling, seeing the world more and more, uh, and that becomes very tough to stay at one place. And, but at least I'm here and I can speak to you all. That makes me happy. And poetry, I think poetry always served the space, much required space uh, for poets, for readers to understand the joy in the inconclusive. It allows us to bridge the imperfect gap or the imperfect fit between perception, language and articulation. Uh, especially when it comes to understanding those emotions uh, which cannot be put into direct or literal sentences. Uh, like last year, uh, last year I did pen down a couple of, not a couple of, maybe four to five poems on the lockdown scenario all around. And this year, what happened uh, by the virtue of my job, I have to go to office daily. And daily I, can, I, like, I get a news of some of my colleagues like getting sick or uh, somebody is passing away, uh, which is really difficult to handle at times. Uh, like you have to work and at the same time, uh, you have to uh, like handle all these news every day. So uh, like uh, there's a poem like during the last uh, phase of the Bengal elections and when the lockdown was almost announced in Bengal and uh, we had those pictures of people burning in burning huts, and also I was reported at my office that a lot of uh, like dead bodies, uh, like uh, the, amount, the number of dead bodies are increasing in the cremation grounds. So I wrote this poem, The Mound Grows. The grave earth looks uneasy. Stories are being covered up, some that were still being written suffocated under the weight of more unfinished ones. A mound grows. Tears have lost their way under a flood of sweat streaming down the brow. As hands run over faces, vapors lie thick on eyeballs. Loose shrouds flutter over the will to go back in time. The mound grows. The salt that I tasted yesterday does not satisfy my tongue's craving. It loiters over a pair of broken banks through which I sighed yesterday. The mound grows. What about the people I no longer speak to? Those whom I saw just once and the ones I don't remember? The mounds grow. Uh, there, uh, like I have been writing some more poems like last year, it was a bit direct uh, on the lockdown scenario in India. But this time, like, I feel uh, like a strange kind of uneasiness uh, while I get back to my poems. And I, uh, during this period, I think uh, I, I, I try to explore more about other themes like nostalgia, like visit my olden days, my grandparents and all so as to keep myself a bit diverted from this daily situation. Well, it's important, I think, to maintain ways to keep us. First of all, I'll also say, I also really enjoyed that mix of um, these images of water vapor and kind of this flooding as well that was coming along kind of descriptions of very like concrete images. 
Um, and I was going to say, I think that, yeah, keeping ourselves connected in some meaningful ways um, to the world, despite what's happening, is really important to staying sane. Are there any strategies that you four have found that, um, you know, that you do some sort of something that allows you to kind of stay somehow connected to the world, despite all the tragedy happening around you, or to still keep sane in your head, or still keep in a soft space for yourself? I assume Sonnet has already given us some, but if you want to go further, yeah, please tell us more. Uh, you know, uh, there's no particular strategy regarding it, like how to uh, survive. Like survival is uh, such a thing that would come, like, happens. Not that you survival. Like you get back, uh, uh, like after your daily activities, back to bed at night, you think about something or uh, so I think uh, I'm no different. I'm doing the same thing. I keep on visiting my old friends, uh, old friends uh, over phone and of course writing and reading uh, helps a lot. Of course watching a lot of movies nowadays. The things a lot of us are doing everywhere, I guess. Uh, what about uh, you, Akriti? I know that it's been a little bit difficult because Delhi is a little, um, it's a very kind of controlled location. Have you been able to keep yourself afloat in certain ways? Uh, one is, you know, other than the parts of how we meaningfully engage with the world, I'd also like to place more emphasis on those meaningless aspects of life that can help us, you know, stay afloat like you mentioned movies or music and uh, even binge watching or just um, turning to comedy i think somewhere at this is where at this time sometimes if we just you know uh, forget forgetting is important and i think you know that's why children tend to become happy even after they go through pain and then they become happy you know because they're able to forget and for moments of periods it's essential that we too forget and I think these uh, small activities, whatever they are for you, whether it's watching movies, whether it is cooking, whether it is gardening, simple things, I think they can sort of help us, you know, stay knitted. And um, towards the other thing, you know, which Anju Ma'am had mentioned, you know, that my imagination is not blocked. And uh, I think that is very essential because one of, um, we all know that, you know, somewhere uh, a huge part of art is that it's therapeutic for us. And, um, in the sense that I think um, there was this particular part that I had written that, uh, you know, even if uh, you find yourself in moments utterly alone, like, you know, when you are uh, isolated or something, and you need not think of it as helplessness, because we may not always be able to alter how we are, or where we are, or what keeps us, because we can't define or control the circumstances around us. But as long as, you know, there is always something more, because as long as there is breath, there is ability and you know there is this ability to escape to fold and expand our inner arms and try to find and listen to the music and you know most of the time when we use nature uh, in our poems people tend to think it's a metaphor and but it's really not you know like when we connect to nature whether it's rain whether it's music or um, whether it's art it's reading or writing i think it helps us uh, it is one of the ways we can grieve one of the ways we can process and one of the ways we can reconnect to the joy that is also inherent to our being. It's not necessary that we need to seek joy always, you know, in things and activities, but there is joy in just being and, uh, you know, sort of like more childhood when we are children, you know, uh, there is joy in just being. And uh, I think that with, um, you know, just keeping myself engaged, like exploring new things. Maybe I've started exploring more of electronic and ambient music. And I think um, it, when something new, you are introduced to something new, you respond to it. And uh, I think just different small, small coping activities, I think help us, you know, stay afloat. Anjuman and then Ashwani, sir, you are the veterans of the group. Do you have any particular advice to give us youngsters about how to live life in a more fulfilling way in this time and day? Oh, you're asking me? Yes, yes, yes. I was asking nothing, but Anjuman. I thought you were asking Ashwini. 
I said okay. Anju, no, 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 no. but yes. Okay, just call me Anju. No, this man thing I no, don't no, hear very no, often. Kiran, Kiran, Kiran. Just a brief background, you know. We need her advice, you know, because she has worked on. <laughs> no advice. Uh, no, no, no uh, advice. Anju, please, please, you know. Anju, I'm laughing. He knows that. I'm, 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 you know, okay, we, are, we are good friends. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling a lot. I'm laughing a lot. Uh, you know, uh, uh, sonnet uh, after a long time. I'm really, I can tell you, you know. For the last three weeks, uh, I have been struggling to get oxygen for people, and some of them died, you know. Uncle died, you know, in Nasik. Uh, his cry uh, is still haunting me. Uh, Bua died, you know, without oxygen in you know, some remote place, you know. So today is the first time when I'm feeling a little more, uh, uh, you know, put dialogically. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I feel like I'm part of your skin as well, you know. Uh, this is really a, a very meta, you know, it, it has its own metaphysics, you know, a very sublime metaphysics I'm experiencing, you know. I, I haven't it, uh, laughed enough, you know, because every day, like a Roman philosopher Seneca, I would come to the bed in the middle of the night, and then, you know, and then I would look at my misdeeds that I have done in my life, and I would tell myself, like Seneca would tell himself, I pardon yourself, you know. So you can imagine the strong guilt, you know, that why I'm alive, you know. So, so I, I, I'm something that, you know, that, that, that's what is uh, keeping me alive, you know. So I'm very happy. But, but Anju, who has wor worked on uh, Sindhi Sufi poetry, I think she is in the best position to tell us, you know. And perhaps uh, I have said something about, uh, if I don't recall now what I said about Karuna. And the second aspect that I'm looking at these days, uh, a very Buddhist idea, because I come from a Buddhist place, you know, uh, where I have written a poem about Pablo Neruda recently. Uh, if you allow me, I will read that poem. It's a love poem about Pablo Neruda coming to my Buddhist town, you know. And, uh, and, and that's the idea, the Buddhist idea of Maitri. It's not the friendship of typical Aristotelian friendship, you know, transactional friendship. So this Maitri, you know, where, where we become part of the skin of everyone. Uh, that's not the ordinary humanity of Homo sapiens. You know? So this matri, you know, extends to inanimate world. You know? In the pandemic, we don't talk about inanimate world. You know, we don't talk about river, river, rivulets. You know, we don't talk about flowers. We don't talk about a smell. We don't talk about you know. There are so many things. You know, organic, inorganic. They're all part of us. You know? They're all part of us. What is called the garbage of the civilization. You know. This is the curse of the civilization pandemic. We have to deal with it. We have to live through it and come back and relocate our metaphysical memories, if not physical memories. That's what I would say. That's what I believe in. So, Anju, please. Um, yeah, no, no. I was, I was hearing Ashwini, and he's such a wonderfully wide thinker. You know, he's got such a knowledge and so many things. But when the micro gets us, a death, a feeling, we forget the wideness of things. And that's what I try to remember. Because even a person like who him was such a wide thinker. But when something happens, like like it's my loot. But it's important, like so it's you know, somebody's gone. Somebody's gone away. So again, if we go back to our own Vedantic philosophy and just distance ourselves, which is very hard. So how do I distance myself is first of all to try to be myself. I don't try to have something I should do during the pandemic. There's nothing I do that I don't do. I follow my routine. I don't change it. it makes no difference. Even a small thing. Some people said, let the hair grow white and blue and green. I said, who cares? Just be as you were, you know? So that distancing, which our whole Vedantic philosophy has taught us. So now's the time to practice it, I guess. Very hard, but we have to do it. And then, you know, the thing that struck me today, I was hearing the, this professor from Houston University, and he spoke about, uh, it's very hard to control a country like India. And since morning, I've been thinking we should talk about, uh, India is a big country. When are we going to break it up into small uh, pieces, literally, like you have Oregon, which I go to a lot. I mean, those places don't have COVID. They've got all this climate change we talk about. So why do we always look at India as one country when we really need to really break it up and to function in smaller units? And I'm glad the states have taken over charge because this whole thing of thinking 
the center is going to control us and guide us and solve our problems is rubbish. And this Houston professor said this very thing. It's going to be impossible for a country like India to solve this pandemic easily. And I read about this Sarpanch in the village, quite close to Mumbai. There's never been a problem in his village, not just a pandemic, because he has functioned in an auton autonomous way. He doesn't care what everybody says. This is how he feels his village, his community should function. So that's what we need to also start thinking. Can we take over and not just blame others and take over our little communities? How do we do that? Auroville has done it so well. Other places have done it. So why do we always depend on the center and Modi and the BJP and I don't know what rubbish? I think that's this what is I think. that I also want to bring forward like there is this part where you know uh, we all know what is uh, the issue with the government and there's already been enough mention but it's our lives and uh, our beings so how is it that we can you know um, just sit here and think you know because that's not going to solve anything we have to take accountability that it's our lives and our joy and our people so if there is something and not just uh, in discussions not just in on uh, you know by sharing posts but I think most of the information that is circulated is confusing. There is very little action-oriented information that goes around. Right. If I, uh, at my age, see most of the information, it is all um, about who, you know, changing color, the posting mm -hmm. something, which is all metaphoric and it has its, uh, you, know, exactly. you know, symbolic meaning, but the action-oriented level. And because the population density and the country that India is, I think it's sort of inevitable. I mean, it's sort of impossible to imagine that if we don't manage it at multiple planes or we don't look at it from that uh, pragmatic aspect, it's simply not possible because there are just there are density, the density of population they have here. We cannot compare it to other countries and the strata of uh, economic, uh, you know, economic strata and the rural pockets and the urban pockets, the accessibility of medical healthcare facilities. So I think uh, somewhere our concentration should be, even for now and for later, as to how what we can do and uh, how it can be more managed. We have technology, we have youth and adults and people who can actually, you know, take these initiatives on our own as well. So because uh, perhaps we didn't anticipate the second COVID wave to be something like this, but now knowing somewhere, I think uh, it should be somewhere at least more action oriented than uh, just, you know, uh, thinking that it's just gonna work out on its own because this is something that we are facing as a people. Yes. Yeah, and not only that, we start to feel helpless. Yes, exactly. Well, I spoke to people in Auroville and I just asked a friend of mine, how many cases? She's saying two people have died. Now, you know, in a, such a wide area because of what they have done. See, I'm not a political person, so I can't do it. But mm -hmm. definitely my mind is going that direction. That the country, I don't know what these political minds have. There are some great minds here. But... Uh, I'm just wondering, in today's session is about poetry. As poets, what can we do besides posting our feelings, besides posting our, uh, as you said, our symbol, uh, symbolic things and metaphors, what can we do? We haven't really done anything. Like the theatre people have started up a, a fund for theatre artists and uh, Kiran maybe can start something, he's young enough. And then, you know, theatre people have started some fund. The press people, press club and other places, they've started something. What have we done as poets? I've asked myself that question too. We've just written, which is our job, fine. But what can we do as a community is a question I'd like to bring up today. Whoever's listening, maybe you can ask them. Yes, and I think this is the perfect... Oh, I wasn't trying to interrupt, but um, some people in the audience uh, who are also there wanted to say some things um i uh, and i also really wanted you know given these types of questions that we're asking i think it's really important to get some people involved like in a bigger group because this is an issue that affects all of us it affects not only indians but even the human race right and i think there's a lot that we can learn from each other i think um Karan wanted to share something first and then i'll ask because so, he has to step out he has an emergency so i'll ask him to just briefly share what he wanted to share including a poem of his and then Sonia also want to share something Akriti I apologize for interrupting you if you want uh, maybe you can circle back after that <laughs> but I just want to make sure everyone who's trying to say something also gets a chance so 
why don't we go ahead with Akriti's point first because I really don't want to disturb this flow of thought. Akriti, why don't you go ahead? I think I mostly covered it uh, in that sense because um, I think so. While like you know, Anjuma mentioned there would be the great political minds in there. That requires, you know, we cater to it in that manner. But the bashing is one aspect. What I see, at least in my age or in my age group, is that what we do is more symbolic and we are concentrated uh, towards it. And while it has its, uh, you know, it has its purpose, like, you know, awareness has its purpose. And it's not just with COVID, even with climate change or any other thing. So even if you have this uh, low information coming your way and uh, you feel helpless after a point, you feel depressed because you don't know how to channelize it into something that will actually solve the situation. So if instead of circulating information only that you, because we are already aware what is happening, you know, it's not, it, this is not a situation where, uh, any of us are blindfolded and we don't know what's happening, but even small action oriented actions like smaller groups, smaller panels, uh, smaller apps, you know, they would go a long way uh, to actually make pragmatic changes, you know, to on, uh, you know, and redefine what is it, not redefine, but at least help us all in a way, you know, to change the reality of what is happening out here. Yeah, that's No, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, Karan, please uh, share what is your poem and some. Well, of first poems. of all, th yeah. th thank you guys for speaking up. It was really inspiring to to hear your poetry and not just hear your poetry, but hear how much effort goes into writing that poetry. Like how how, how the, the thought process behind the poetry. I I I I I love to be like a constant learner about the craft of of all kinds of literature, and it really inspires me to hear when. When, when I heard this, the, the, the weight of the work, the weight of the thought process that poets put into, you know, it could be just 15 lines, but that 15 lines is 15 hours, 15 days, 15 months of like a life affirming decisions, life changing decisions, you know. So um, it, it was really inspiring to hear you guys speak. Um, I'm not a poet. I'm primarily a fiction writer or a nonfiction writer. But for me, it, it was one of these moments where I, I don't know. Sometimes the, the words just come out when when there's so much when there's so much happening around you, the, the, the words almost write themselves, I guess. Uh, so I also had a poem to share with you guys, if you will all allow me. Uh, this one is called "View from the Vista," and uh, you can guess what the vista is. You really don't have to explain that. Have you ever placed sto stone on stone? Shoveling hard-hearted sand and cement, mixing mortar, an opaque mask over your eyes. Lay the bedding, butter up one end, look for light colors, aqua, beige and white, stone cold. Keep your distance, they are but a pantone of pain, white hot warmth outside your wall, gasping for breath. Have you ever tried not giving a flying fugue, a dissociative state, an inability to remember one's past? One's past are beyond your line of vision, over the curvature of earth, across hemispheres and continents. The wall is a shield, vaccinating firewalls, news feeds on fire, maelstrom of misery, thermal reactions, oxygen and cremation fires, and lack thereof. There are a million other things you could do besides breathing the outside air. Asbestos and apathy make a heady cocktail. Suffocate in your safety until there are no more breaths to waste. Yes, it's an interesting macro commentary about a lot of things that the pandemic has given us and a lot of the different aspects of life if we were to condense it i think into a poetic space i know that sonia as well you know, can i interrupt a minute yeah, please please Andrew, can yeah. i interrupt a minute yeah, of there, course. Are some, yeah. there are some people asking for the link there are people oh. asking for the link and they're stuck on fb oh i've my. got three messages well, okay um, so send me a link yeah, I'll send it again. Um, uh, uh, okay, it's there. it's a little late now for them to come, but at least later is better than ever. But uh, yes, uh, let me at least I'll send that while I'm. Uh, I, and I also want to say that um, we're also starting the part of this session where I want people to be reading maybe from their own poems or from telling their own thoughts and giving their own reactions to the other speakers, because there's a lot that we've learned from the four panelists today. But I also think we can learn from each other. So. Um, I'll, I'll send you the link. But in the meantime, I know Sonia had something to add to the earlier conversation. She also writes, so she might have something to contribute as well. So please, Sonia, if it's still permanent, pertinent, feel free to speak up. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kiran. Am I audible? 
Yes. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, in continuation of what uh, Anjuma was talking about. Uh, the thing is, you know, often there has been a tendency in a country like India to consider the Sarkar as a Maibab Sarkar. You know, because we have come from that colonial uh, and the pre-colonial mentality where there has been a government that is always in charge of providing for the people. And that kind of a tendency is something that has percolated down the decades, actually. So uh, that is why we tend to place so much of faith and responsibility on the government. And if you think about it, over the decades, you know, uh, let us uh, talk about Nehruvian optimism. Uh, let us talk about that brand of socialism, statesmanship, um, the kind of, uh, let's say, opening up, though it was highly flawed, licensing Raj under Indira Gandhi, the, the uh, you know, uh, globalization that came under Rajiv Gandhi, the telecom revolution, and, and all of those things. If you think about it, we have had a, a possibility of governments which have actually tried to look out for the people in one capacity city or the other, which again reinforced the faith of the people in, in said government. But, uh, you know, from the, I think from the 2000s or the, the, the second decade of the 2000s, what has happened is that the government has begun a, a, a very, very, uh, let's say, a very polarized approach towards, uh, you know, ideology. And it has made sure that only one side of the story is being heard. And on account of this, the, the protectorate that the government was earlier seen as, you know, the role that it was playing, is now changed into something of, I would say, um, uh, an advertiser. And, and not only that, you know, talking about, uh, you know, the breaking up of this entire federal setup into smaller setups, so to speak. Uh, this kind of uh, fragmentation or subnationalism, as we call it, has already been in existence because look at the kind of parties that are ruling uh, the states in almost every state in, in this country. They have a regional basis, they have regional issues, and that is what they, the platform that they fight on and they win. There is hardly a national party in, you know, uh, in town that has won a state election, if you think about it. And it is on the local issues that you know, people fight and they win. So that breakdown or breaking down of the entire country into smaller units has already come into place. And you know, with this coming of GST and the apportioning of, of GST revenues to states, et cetera, what the government is trying to do is, it is trying to pull back into the federal structure. Now this might sound highly, uh, let's say technical or political, but then if you look beneath the surface, you already see the tensions that are existing between the states as individuals and the state as uh, you know, a governing authority over all of this and with the citizen in the middle of all of these things that is the interesting thing you know we have very very uh, local geographical identities we have larger regional identities we have state identities and then we have the national identity so where are we placed in all of this so uh, in a sense of the term it has always been every man for himself actually speaking it is only for very few things that we approach the state or we look towards the state you know, it, it is there in our day-to-day -day vocabulary as well. So I would say that, you know, uh, what Anjumam is talking about is actually already all pervasive, has been there for decades and is now more apparent than ever. That's what I wanted to say. Well, I just... And, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I just... Um, uh, I'm not... No, I heard you. I heard you and I'm not sure... See, the major decisions are still controlled from the center. Yes. Like whether it is uh, the GST or the Aadhaar card or how you pay your taxes. So the states are fighting on buying the local things. They might be about the water supply, the river, this, that. But the main thing is still controlled by the central government, including if natural relations. So everything is controlled by the center. So I don't see there has been so decentralization in the true sense. At all. But, but that is the case, I think, almost everywhere, because even if you're mentioning the USA, the federal spending structure is decided by the, the you know, the government at the center, you know, and uh, sometimes they just uh, decide not to release the funds and then, you know, the Congress is held to ransom. There is no money to spend. There is no money to pay people on a weekly basis. You know, Trump has done that a couple of times. So it's, it's actually a power play. Actually, Anjumam, what I think is, you know, it's a matter of conscience. 
it is it is not just about uh, you know governing it is governing with the conscience and i think that is symptomatic of the age and the people who are there it, government is a very people centric thing you know not just from the voting basis but also who you are voting and and getting up there kind of a thing so it, it's it's a question of that conscience and how far that conscience is alive in people uh, you know in the ones who govern us that that matters a lot mm. <laughs> India has been rated as the fourth most uh, corrupted country in the world. It just came out about uh, four days, five days back. Yeah. What do you expect? Know, so that, that's tell you. Anyway, this is that's too wide. You know, true. Kiran is looking at poetry, I know. So. <laughs> because it is these things you know these ideas and these concepts that inform our work also as poets actually speaking yeah, you know exactly. uh, because and we don't today, write political poetry yeah today i, I wrote true. A there's book, hardly uh, any political poetry ashwini is there political poetry around ashwini may know uh, yeah uh, i i anju the the question you know the two very brief response kiran you know one uh, you know uh, the there is what we are trying to do Uh, my new book is already out uh, from routledge internationally uh, where we have reflected on uh, you know pandemic uh, on the one hand uh, is a deeply uh, you know emotive uh, uh, tragic experience but in terms of democratic experience if you look at it has also turned into what we call semi authoritarian authoritarian and what political scientists we call it you know democratic backsliding you know this has happened globally you know in fact we are doing research publishing around that how pandemic has allowed you know authoritarian leaders populist leaders xenophobic leaders to acquire a larger than life cult status you know secondly uh, pandemic has also been very unfortunate in terms of the violation of human rights thirdly structurally speaking pandemic has destroyed uh, you know what is called a uh, symmetrical arrangements of the governance you know fourth as my colleagues have been talking about philosophers and political scientists around the world that pandemic governance flourishes on the basis of suffering you know so suffering has become a instrument a instrument to govern people harass people just look at the prisons you know if i write if i write a political poem i'm gone i'm gone you know so anju finally uh, all all poetry is political all poetry is political you know uh the, the, the linguistic experience is different you know, you know different but every poem that we do is political they can't be non political you know. uh, i think in a very short i would like to sum up you know that all if we are not political and that we are not you know what we are i mean like in the sense of poetry fiction and this is not unusual experience for the literature you know right from the london plague right from the homer you know Uh, these days you know if you look at prem chand has written about plague cholera uh, sanskar you know if just look at you know the wide landscape of the literature you know disease death and despite that i'm repeating and again and again somebody asked me about karuna somebody asked me about maitri i think the world you know kiran will not survive you know these demographs will come these dictators will come and go the world will survive we will survive only because of the maitri and the karuna in a larger buddhist sense you know in the larger secular normative sense i hope so absolutely i think that that adds to the idea of the conscience that i was talking about it's not just the governments it's also people you know uh, unless you have a certain degree of conscience it is not possible to have that idea of karuna that that ashwini sir was talking about I'm also getting the sense, Ashwani, sir, that this is uh, something you really. I, I really hope that you explore this in depth because I'm getting the sense that some real, like, really beautiful, like, work can come out of your exploration of these thoughts. And I'm, whether it comes out of some mahakavya of some sort or an essay, I don't know. But I'm just saying that if we can. I, I hope that to see something bigger out of this because it has a lot of potential, especially linked to the era we live in. So, <laughs> on that note, I think that let's uh, go back to poem. You know, I want to hear uh, you know poems from my colleagues and friends. Yes, here. as well. Yes, yes. So please, is there, is there anyone else who wants to kind of share a poem or speak out against the second wave for a moment? Oh, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you, Shabnam. Thank you. Uh, 
Yes, uh, so I just scribbled a few things as the poems were being read and I was so moved and I, I think they might come out as a poem. <laughs> so um, I, I found like in this time, uh, the contagion has become kind of a meta meme, clearly. Um, and from what I got from your very marvelous uh, evocations of this great untethering that we're going through is that we're in a kind of caged uh, freedom. We are in a kind of interactive asceticism and we're forced into kind of a passionate patience. We become emotional archeologists. We don't have any answers, so we have to become the answer. And what I've found um, recently is when I find a poem being presented uh, on a portal that's multimedia, perhaps with music accompanying it or a painting, that affective component that Mr. Ashwini was talking about uh, fleshes out the poem and reaches the reader and the listener more viscerally. So I was wondering, uh, it also helps break out of the shackles of semiotic fixity. I think that's what this time has done to us. Uh, we've gone deeper into ourselves and into perhaps each other. Um, so I was wondering uh, what all of you think about that method of presentation in a time where we're separated like this. And also, thank you. It, it's been wonderful and privileged listening. And thank you, of course, for coming and sharing your thoughts. Would anyone like to take a second uh, to answer Shabna? Yeah, um, and Sudeep uh, also um, is an, a young poet and he said he'd want to share something a little later. But if, if anyone at first would like to answer Shabna Ma'am's questions or concerns, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, um, can I? I, I, I guess <laughs> if you'd like. <laughs> Are you going to regret inviting me, Kiran? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I I want this to be a a space for everyone who's involved. But uh, yes, I won't regret it. Don't worry. <laughs> if anything, it's an, <laughs> no, uh, also written, and you've also curate, and even Sadeep is a poet, so it might be an interesting space also to hear from some other people who are not the invited speakers to share thoughts. But of course, I want the invited speakers to obviously feel like they're getting the due space. But uh, <laughs> anyways, sure, okay, why not? Let, let it be. I'm glad that, you know, Shabnam ji uh, brought that, uh, the, the idea of, of actually uh, narrating uh, these poems and, you know, kind of presenting them out there beyond the scope of words. Because uh, I think that much is conveyed through the idea of of voices, you know, uh, and uh, the reactions that that come as the person is reading. I mean, all of us can testify to the fact that you know we are somebody else when we read our poems. Our poems sound uh, uh, certainly something uh, uh, rather interesting when when we read them out rather than just putting them out on the page, you know, right there. And I think that you know uh, 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 an archive of of such narratives is something that one leaves for posterity so that people know that we were here and yeah. and these were the, the things that we wanted to speak about and this is how we used to be. So uh, I think that uh, such voices, you know, keeping them uh, is, is a wonderful idea and that's very important. It, it adds to that component uh, that, that goes beyond, uh, I think, even the idea of performative space. So, yeah. Anyone uh, from the any one of the speakers. I feel like Sonnet, I would like to, I know you're not volunteering, but you've spoken by far the least out of the four people. So I feel like I need to push you to speak. I feel like I'm like the teacher who has to like shove. <laughs> but anyways, yes, please share some of your thoughts, please. Uh, uh, it's uh, always nice to hear Kiran, you know, than to keep on speaking sometimes because you can hear so many people sharing so many beautiful things that would help you mm -hmm. at least to pass these days. Uh, uh, about uh, see, presenting something, uh, I would I would debate uh, a bit from the questions maybe, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, about presenting something during this phase and a lot of pol political stuff uh, were also discussed, you know, and about how we can participate in things uh, during this pandemic. I think people are not serious at all because uh, I was hearing a lot of people uh, uh, 
saying that we can do this uh, or we should do like many things. But uh, last day I was going to a market, like I was passing through a market and it was due to my office work, not, not because of traveling. And uh, if I had a picture of that market, I would have shown you here. So uh, I think uh, you cannot just keep on blaming people who are governing us or how the government is functioning because it is functioning through a certain system which is not new to us. It has been in the past and it is like, it is almost the same now. But uh, regarding our self-awareness, we are not, we are still not aware at all. Unless something happens to us personally, we are not getting into it. And uh, as what, what we can do as, like I feel is that we are humans first, so we can just go outside our gates and look around. You can at least find, you can find a stray dog or something. You can feed it, feed it or you can just, uh, if you stay a bit longer, you can find some more people because they are, uh, they, they are all of us, some beggars, some people who are, you know, uh, trying to meet their needs somehow, looking for some works like daily wages and all. They are still there, you know, walking by, loitering in the streets sometimes. So that you can do, uh, and that doesn't require to be a poet or something. Uh, like you can just be a human for that and do that. You do not need a form of discussion for that. It is what I'm talking is just about self-awareness. Uh, so uh, this is the thing which I wanted to add, like for, out of all these discussions. Wonderful. So let me um, let me ask Sudeep now to because he wanted to add something. Go ahead and uh, speak if you'd like, Sudeep. Thank you, Kiran, and thank you everyone for having me amongst you. So it's a pleasure to speak to understanding yours more understanding yours than most would be at this in these times. I had a dream last night, um, which was basically. So it's, um, I'm at Mumbai Central Station yeah. and um, I'm boarding a train and I've not traveled by train for close to about six years now. So I've been flights, 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 but I miss the trains. Um, I was at the station and uh, we were following social distancing norms and trying to board the train. And uh, I remembered I had forgotten something. Um, just before boarding the train, I turned back. And in that moment, um, the train started to move and I knew I had to be on that train. There, there were no two ways about it. So I, I grabbed onto the door only to realize that um, the doors are all shut. There is no way in. And I held on. I held on for dear life as the train moved on and on and on, hoping, trying to calculate, doing the mental math of figuring out which station would be the nearest, which station would be next, so that I get down and board the train, actually enter the train. And uh, I think that characterizes the whole uh, experience of this pandemic for me, because last year, I remember during the first lockdown, um, I was in Bangalore with my adopted home. And I, I, wrote, I was writing poems during Napo Remo, uh, some of which ended up getting published um, uh, in an anthology on on the lockdown, on the experience of quarantine, on the experience of uh, the lockdown and the pandemic. Uh, this year, I have not been able to write much at all. Um, Kiran, you you spoke about you asked some some people, have you been able to write? Are you writing much? And and uh, although I know that question was not directed to me, but uh, if I may presume to answer, uh, it it has been particularly hard on me in terms of my writing. I I. Uh, there is only one thing that I have written that I would like to share if I may, and I won't waste time. I'd like to get to it. May I? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this one is called, This is How It Ends. The end of the world will not come with fire and brimstone or a raging tsunami that washes away both sin and sinners. No. It will come unannounced, creeping in incrementally like half-baked measures or a company's takeover, 
hostile, but suited and booted, proclaiming that even in death, there will always be dignity. It will come on a Sunday afternoon when we have eaten our fill of rice, dal, paisam, and lies. When we are lazing about in that twilight zone whose border begins as the weekend winds down, and the coming week amasses its troops, clears its throat for a confusing war cry, we are the weak. We are not weak. What? The world will end during an unskippable ad in the YouTube video. At the 29 second mark, when you are certain that the worst is almost over, that you have triumphed over corporate greed and impatience, in that second, the world will play another unskippable ad, then one more, and another, until you see that the video you had queued up has been taken down, and all that's left to watch is the chaos of entropy. In all this decay, we preserve, persevere, and lie prostrate before the old gods and their unsanctioned agents, whose temples are ours to worship at as we pray for our lives and pay with our lives. This is how it ends. The world stops spinning, there's no more winning, just immeasurable loss and a few signs that vaguely point in no definite direction as we march on to brace ourselves, hunker down in self-built bunkers. Hibernation beckons. When do you reckon we will wake, stretch, shake off the stench of twice conferred failure and breathe again at a pace that doesn't need us to run, run and keep on running on feet that struggle to simply walk? Very interesting poem, yes, and I, I I also like again that it has this kind of socio satirical element, and it reminds me a lot of certain works of the care of care. I mean, I guess maybe this is a little bit of a dated comparison, but it reminds me a little bit of some beat poetry as well that also likes to kind of be like mm -hmm. early Ginsburg and this kind of mm -hmm. being very political and also making poetry out of it. I think it's. It's, it's, it's a pace, right? It's a pace at the end of the day. I mean, uh, this unbelievable pace at which um, this pandemic has been pulling me along as the train dream talked about. And uh, But yeah, um, thank you for giving me food for thought about my poem. I mean, I haven't thought about it in that direction. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to either, I think we're starting, we're going a little over quite over now. So I'm thinking, I, th I would like at the very least from our, our featured speakers to give their last thought, the last words of reflection before we go. But anyone else from the audience who wants to say something maybe brief or read something brief or? Well, I'm just uh, wanted to marvel at the very last poem uh, because this is not the kind of reality that you can configure into any kind of aesthetic logic uh, and uh, the gentleman just did that. So thank you, that was very moving. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for your words, Shabdam ma'am. Now, do we, yes, I, I think I'll just ask for anyone, anyone in our group of featured poets, do you have any last things you'd like to impart to the group or any last words of something that you feel like should be said? I want to uh, take you back to the thought, you know, uh, that Ashwin Lisa mentioned uh, about art being political, because that is something that I see um, very popular in today's time. And to be uh, personally, I don't think I've entirely grasped the concept ever as to art being po uh, just political, because I don't think it has to be a polarized message, you know, a polarized thinking pattern, because uh, I think in that sense, the artist is on a journey and I start to think that we, uh, if we become preachers, you know, we start to lose that sense of, uh, that we don't want to preach. It's, uh, so when you open a book, like, you know, it's, there is a resonance in what you read and you want the reader or anybody who is on that journey to be able to think for themselves and, you know, mm -hmm. be a part of that journey. And uh, when I think about art being political, everything we do, so whether you write, whatever you create, 
it's a, it's a, it's political because it's a consequence of our being you know we are part of the societal political structure and so hence whatever we but uh, you know with whatever intention we say whether it's my pain or your pain whether i'm talking about a plant whether the death of things or the beauty of them it will become political because it exists in a time and era and it is conditioned and you know some big you know in that graph but at the same time you know uh, when we talk about how um, pain affects us and then you know there is uh, the buddhist view and you know how he would talk about this um when you sort of i think uh, this is one of the things that happen when you're cut and uh, when you wake up it's like you know uh, life as how we usually pre this preconceived conceived notion it feels like more a dream and then it starts to split because uh, you know it's not uh, how you nobody prepares you for it nobody is going to prepare you for the acute suffering uh, there is no classroom for it there is no kind of knowledge that is truly imparted it is at the end an individual journey and whether uh, most of uh, if we look at you know the ages you know it's war or pandemic it's not the first time you know this is coming to uh, this is like we are facing in the human civilization and uh, Uh, last year i think i wrote an article about why i cannot think of the virus as inherently evil thing because in a way if you stand outside or if you think from a scientific perspective it's just an organism that contradicts our existence and uh, you know so you are just a speck and that's both uh, in the sense the most beautiful and terrifying thing to know and as you i think uh, what we do with when we see too much pain and death is that we see that uh, you know we live in a societal bubble where we have parameters which shape our logic and thinking and we think this is life but really from a scientific stand point of view or from a buddhist stand point of view and those are then again just perspectives and i think knowledge at the end when it's in a book it is still in the book it's only when you you know truly grasp it for yourself then uh, that is the only that's how it is realization and that is the only true knowledge everything else is someone else's theory someone else's understanding of it so even if i'm quoting some writer or i'm quoting um, anything from any book whether it's religious or whether it's a great thinker again i'm just borrowing his explorations and unless it is seeped down to my existence you know into my reality and i think somewhere poetry or art is a continuously moving process and you know it's not like uh, today i've written something and this is defines me personally i don't want to be even called a poet i would prefer it writing as a verb you know because uh, it's not my identity if i start to uh, you know take care of plants tomorrow if i start to draw tomorrow it's not uh, you know it's not a shackle it's something free flowing and it's something that you grow in and out of and i think one of the things that happens with uh that has happened always with human civilization whether it's renaissance that you witness or other great thinkers or writers is because when we are uh, sh- shaken there is this disgruntlement and there is the pain and the shock of reality i think uh, we, like you know the way ashwini sir was talking about so every we start to re question things and we start to reexamine what we have taken for granted or what we you know understand and so in a sense of what we see as poetry and art and what is the role of an artist i think it's always a journey it's an exploration and uh, you know like this human exploration of being and pain is a very essential component of it and uh, only when it really hits us i think uh, we begin to you know reshape it starts to reshape us from within i think i'll stop now But thank you <laughs> uh, may i react to that sure yes. um so um yeah i i think you're right the pandemic has sort of left us to sort of grow in the dark um and uh, your words reminded me of what uh, rumi said that the wound is where the light enters you um but i think this is different because the wound is collective and that's what makes it more cataclysmic in nature and i think there's a major shift happening i think uh, that's because of it. Uh, if we experience a wound you know fully experience its reality we will always realize that the wound is never isolated right. it is never been isolated because there yes. is no isolated self so when you mm-hmm. have truly felt pain you will yeah. be able to feel the pain of everything else that exists right. and uh, that is when you know suffering here it is just more apparent it's more in the face but it has right. always existed yes i refer to that wonderful yes It's very insightful. 
And it kind of goes and it bleeds a little bit to one of the questions Ashwani said had posed back in the beginning about how the pandemic will change the way that we view the world from a cultural mm -hmm. literary perspective, which I think is interesting. Ashwani, so do you want to kind of speak a little bit? I think Akriti also indirectly was saying a lot about that too. So, I mean, do you have anything maybe to tie into that? Or? You know, uh, the other day I was, I was sharing with a very eminent writer globally and, uh, and we agreed, uh, agreed. I guess somebody who has watched my conversation with Apurva Naran on, uh, you know, poetry, uh, I would prefer to be uh, in the state of luminous detachment. You know? luminous detachment, uh, you know, silence flowing through my veins, and I can see blood where also there is a silence, you know, and this silence will continue to grow. I mean, like, a wonderful conversation. I would love to hear more poetry. I mean, like, uh, uh, I, I would not respond to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the issues that have been raised here. Uh, uh, that will be discursive of it. Uh, we are known uh, argumentative people. Uh, but but I would like to be like to be more like uh, more like to be a poet, uh, speaking the language of the skin, you know, the skin of the soul. You know. That is how I would like to sum up uh, uh, my thoughts today. You know. uh, every day I learn, uh, every day I learn from the sparrow who comes to my window. So this is also a great window to me, uh, to learning from different voices, uh, different perspectives, you know. Uh, but I would like to hear more poetry. I mean, like. Uh, if we can, uh, you know, a short poem uh, I can hear from Anju Akriti, and uh, I, I know I have called, uh, you know, sonnet in one of my uh, my pieces, uh, a, a sublime monk, you know, a very sublime. He is known for tenderness, you know, a sonnet. I'm looking for tenderness. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for the revival, revival, restoration, the touch of that tenderness. You know, I'm dying for that. You know, I'm dying for. That. Yeah. I haven't met you. I haven't met you. Before. I'm thinking that would be a really good way even because we're, I think that would be a really powerful way to end even is maybe either Anju or Sonnet can give like a, like a, some piece of a poem or something that would give like a really good, like, you know, this is the... And it, Akriti also, you know, a one yeah, tender, you know, well. something, you know, so tender, you know, it's not like typical vanilla tenderness, no, mm -hmm. or, or the, the gooeyness, you know, the tenderness of, of the soft, light, pink tenderness, we are missing her. Um, the poem that I did have, so that one uh, starts with some intensity, but it shifts towards tenderness. So I'm not sure if that is something I want to propose. What about um, you, Anjuman, or like Sonnet? Do you feel like you have a poem that would speak a little bit to the moment? Uh, well, uh... I think uh, there's a poem. I uh, the name of the I wrote this poem last year. Uh, the name of the poem is uh, the answer. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I would do is just read the poem. A dry land seeking liberty to wet itself wonders about the quiet after the storm. The roads are familiar to it. The smell of the air isn't. The trees no longer lias, their commitments are done. Does the new rephrasing require us? An empty bowl falls on the floor. The sound seems familiar. It was there in the quiet before the storm. Uh, are you used to speak? Yeah, lovely, lovely, lovely. What about uh, Anju? Do you have something that you would like to share? Either a poem or some words or some kind of... No, I just... Uh, I think we've said enough and lots of ideas and lots of poems and good thoughts have come across for us to think about. What I, uh, only thing I want to say was, uh, you know, this whole period reminds me of partition. Mm. About yeah. quite a few years back, I had translated uh, partition poetry from Pakistan and India. And somehow the uh, feelings uh, that people are feeling, although the situation is very different, but the like the burning in the guards that you mentioned, that time also there was this exodus and suffering and horrible things were happening. 
So how did they cope with it? And we've had pandemics over the centuries. How do they cope with it? Eventually, people move on somehow. Somehow they move on. And that's a beautiful point. <laughs> Some, somehow we move on. Somehow we pick up the pieces and we we create ourselves again and we relive and we <coughs> existence on earth somehow. So. I think I'll just study the second poem because I wanted to uh, sort of gravitate that you know uh, it's not undermining the grieving or that it's not happening or the denial or that this doesn't happen. The severity of pain doesn't happen, but rather gravitate from it into something tender is where, you know, uh, the healing really begins, I think. So um, this poem, I titled it uh, Umbrella. The loud ringing <laughs> is crow eating its talons. The black night just grew wider and your two thumbs are now suddenly shrunk, too small to hold or even measure this velvet broad cake of being. The crumbs are faces in sorrow, all our faces and numbers cut and accumulated in one long whip. The circle, go, the circle grows heavy. No one taught you how to walk in this. The strange curdling of blood beneath the toes. No one held a chalk stick. No one even mentioned that this too was being. So you floated through life and then suddenly found yourself an invisible oval, almost as silken and black as the night sky. What holds this terror of being but the invisible tiny mouth, your mouth? One tiny creature walks into the graveyard of life rain on its blade of shoulders and with a small promise of fingers builds an umbrella shelter the body but the eyes the eyes for it is the window to the soul that must somehow survive build choral new songs for eventually raise if not die thank you my connection cut out a little bit during the reading unfortunately thank you. But um, thank you. Uh, Anju, uh, uh, are you reading a poem? I thought so. No. I think enough now because even poetry should be in little doses. Yes. We don't enjoy it when it's too much of it. Yes. We, we don't, don't suffer either. So, your feelings. Yes. And my connection is cutting. We have to do or not to, I don't know. We are actualistic arrows. That's what I should do. <laughs> My connection is really getting bad now, which I think is a good time then, incidentally, to start saying goodbye to everyone uh, because I probably might have to just incidentally fall out into the. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a wonderful session though, and I had it's great to get to know you all better, especially the featured speakers, but also the other poets who came to speak up. So, um, I look forward to seeing you all on the other side. <laughs> I don't know when I'll be back in India now, seeing that it's infinitely like... <laughs> other side? Don't say other side. <laughs> I'm at the other side of the border. Don't not say other side. side of life, but... <laughs> but anyway. I, I just want to thank uh, Anju for inviting me. Thank you so much. A pleasure to meet you from across the ocean. Not at all. <laughs> no, sir. Welcome and thanks for your lovely, you know, comments. Well, I hope I have the privilege of meeting you someday. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, Ashwani said I think is the only person in this group I've actually met. So hopefully someday, eventually, I'll meet everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, you all have a wonderful night and um, good luck with what's happening. It's really tough, I know. Bye. Uh, I need to stand. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, yeah. It's been 90 minutes, so it's like, yes, that is starting to the parts of the body. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone.